Okay, thank you. Point with this. Um, so I'd like to talk about the development of the H War since we went um, we went operational in 2002. Um, and um, in fact, I think uh, most of the people who helped develop the H War. Um, <coughs> It is. It's on. Oh, okay. Well, can you move it up a little bit higher? No, move the, uh, the microphone up a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Anyway, I'd like to acknowledge the H Wharf team. Um, I think most people are here, but Gopal, Bob Tulea, Ching Fu, VJ, uh, and Young Kwan. So um, I'd uh, like to start off with since we've been talking about past forecasts and evolution of forecasts, and hopefully with some improvements. Sorry. Um, but um, I, when I was working at uh, the Hurricane Center back in 97, and Bob Sheets and Ron McPherson brought me there, the forecasters were just starting to um, rely more uh, on uh, dynamical forecasts. And so I was brought in to help them interpret the forecast. So this was left for me by Max Mayfield after he worked a mid-shift. It was for Hurricane Olaf in Eastpac in uh, 97. And uh, you can see all the statistical models. Here's Elbar, the BAMS model, Clipper. Uh, we're taking it to the north. And all of the dynamical models, we're taking it to the south. And Max's sense of humor, thanks a lot. <laughs> so um, I love this diagram. I think of it a lot. <laughs> anyway, the, um, the HWARF implementation strategy was really based on uh, the success that uh, we had known from the GFDL model. Overall, um, it uh, had maintained consistently the most skill for track. And so in developing the HWARF, we wanted to retain the strengths of the operational GFDL system in terms of the physics, the ocean coupling, the moving nest. Uh, we, of course, for the Hurricane Center, it would drive the product system identical to the GFDL. Uh, we had to meet or exceed the GFDL performance, particularly for, um, mostly for track, uh, in order to get the go-ahead to implement into operations for the Hurricane Center. We documented that performance. And the development and implementation cycle was roughly, we began in 2002 and went operational in 2007. But we developed a whole implementation strategy in the preliminary testing phases. We were doing separate experiments, testing each and every component, so testing the dynamics, testing each package of the physics, then coupling it to the ocean, um, and then a final bundle um, of all of those components. We did about 200 runs, um, and there was uh, no tuning for any of the specific cases. So once we passed that hurdle, we went into final implementation testing to do homogeneous comparisons with the GFDL system. And uh, we did a, a, an extensive amount of testing. And for a new model, uh, this was really required to do so. We ran for three full hurricane seasons in which we uh, captured all the variability. You know, if you think about it, um, had we run just, for example, for hurricane season 09, we just would have had sheared storms. In 2008, we really just had Gulf of Mexico storms. So that's why we run a whole lot of cases over uh, an extensive period of time. Our requirements were for to uh, have performance um, uh, in both the Atlantic and East Pac basins, which is the Hurricane Center's uh, area of responsibility. We ran over 1,700 HWARF runs four times a day. Uh, and we compared it to the GFDL runs, which were running twice, uh, twice a day then. And we set the standards for performance testing in terms of caseload evaluation criteria, the system functionality in terms of the initialization we would use, the coupling, and um, all the software compliance for codes and scripts to meet uh, NCEP central operations. So it was 
quite an experience for those of us who had never implemented, developed, and implemented a model into operations. So the initial HWARF configuration was a movable uh, and is a movable two-way nested grid, nine-kilometer inner nest, 27-kilometer parent domain, 42 levels over an extensive uh, area, about 75 by 75 domain. Uh, we transitioned all of the success that we had in, with the global model physics that were transitioned into the GFDL model. Uh, a lot of those physics were tuned or developed specifically for tropical cyclone applications. Uh, we were going to, and we do run in cycle, which was an advancement over the GFDL bogus. Uh, and so we um, cycle through the GSI, and um, which uh, we are able to adjust the vortex based on the first guest field, which is the six-hour forecast. And hopefully in the near future, we will start making some good use of core observations. We are coupled to the Princeton Ocean model, thanks to uh, uh, Isaac Guinness's group. And we went in with his initial loop current initialization. And so some of this testing, you know, we looked at storms like Katrina. Yeah, we were doing well with Katrina. And we got the uh, intensification to, uh, you know, to 150 knots, to 147 knots. Uh, we underestimated the landfall of Katrina. So it's not only the intensification, but, you know, the weakening before landfall. Hurricane Wilma was a tough one. Uh, and we uh, ran a lot of experiments on Wilma. And I'll show this in terms of when we're looking at systematic biases, as Richard talked about, in terms of track. But if your track came in a little bit further in the south of the Yucatan, your storm started to fall apart, and your whole forecast went bust. So we had good simulations of these strong storms, but what we started to notice was that we had a weak storm intensity bias, especially at t equals 0, which then would have implications for the 09 season, which I'll show in a minute. But anyway, for the first season, for the inaugural season, it was a pretty good uh, performance. Um, but it happened to be a season in which the, it was the year of the global model, and the global models were beating the pants off of the regional models. Uh, but the H war fared well, at least relatively to the GFDL model. Intensity forecasts were comparable, but we were not quite happy with that uh, loss of skill between four and five days. Anyway, we made some uh, corrections um, after that season going into 08. Uh, Ching Fu made some improvements to the analysis for the weaker storms, making better use of observations, providing better structure for the vortex. Uh, we tuned some of the surface physics um, and improved some of the initialization in the palm. So uh, we did some experiments over the three past seasons, and we did improve uh, T equals zero in the h wharf by 75%, okay? And most of this reduced error 56% at 36 hours, 60 at 96 hours. So you see a dramatic improvement was reducing the error due to the reduction in the negative bias. Unfortunately, then, we ended up going from a weak bias to a, uh, a positive bias. And we saw this in 2008 for storms like Dolly and Faye, in which we ended up intensifying tropical storm Faye to a Cat 3. And so um, we went into 09, and uh, the bottom fell out for us in terms of the H wharf because they were mostly weak, sheared storms. None of the models did particularly well, um, but I, I just here want to focus on the H wharf. The uh, errors grow rapidly, and um, there's uh, deficient representation of the weaker storms. Um, so here are all of the models for intensity, and I'm focusing in now on Erica because she was pretty representative of the weaker storms. And here is the H wharf, a little more egregious than uh, the others. And as Richard mentioned before, if you don't get the intensity right, and here are all the other models, the GFDL, the GFS model, the UK MET, no gaps, and the H wharf, all of the models were forecasting further intensification, and so you got all the tracks going this way, when in fact the uh, storm uh, was virtually collapsing into a, a remnant low. Um, so here is the uh, forecast for the H wharf uh, in terms of the wind swath that the hurricane center gets, forecasting it to what a, a Cat 3 hurricane. Here's the H wharf GFDL. 
the official forecast, and uh, here's the OBS, and I think this was written up by Richard, uh, that the intensity forecast is similar to the previous, but below the consensus of the numerical intensity guidance. And it should be noted that some of these numerical models, such as the HWARF and GFDL, have shown a high bias for a couple of this year's tropical storms. So, you know, we started looking at this. If you look at a vertical cross section uh, through the storms, so um, anyway, uh, this was Hurricane Dean. Well, that's fine. I mean, this is a very strong, you know, textbook kind of vertical structure of a hurricane, and that was good because Dean was a Cat 5. We had a good forecast of that. But then we had the same forecast for Erica, so this was totally unreasonable and um, totally an error. Okay, um, Chris Davis did a comparison. We, we were having uh, help from some people. Chris Davis was looking at the core um, of the H. Wharf hurricane. Mark de Maria was looking at the large scale field. Obviously, we had some problems in the initialization of the H. Wharf. It's far too strong. It's, um, it's initialized with a 65 knot uh, wind. Here is the NCAR AHW in which they use the ENKF initial condition, and you can see it. Their vortex responding very nicely to the shear, um, and uh, the tilt here is associated with subsidence above the surface center. Uh, and so, in fact, we had problems in the initialization of the core. It was far too strong. Mark de Maria did an analysis and showed that even the large-scale hurricane environment was incorrectly uh, analyzed in that, um, was deficiently analyzed in that we didn't properly have the trough and the shear either. And so we have problems in the hurricane environment. So lessons learned. Look, when you run a model in operations, the deficiencies of your model really start to become quite evident. So um, we know, have known that we need more appropriate physics for high res. We're taking a little bit step back. We've got serious challenges. There are no silver bullets. So we need to think about how to proceed short term, <coughs> long term. We had a meeting here last week in which a bunch of us sat down around the table and really started seriously posing some questions here in terms of the physics, the initialization, and the data simulation. This meeting was convened by Davis, Sergi, and Doyle. I think that sounds like an accounting firm, doesn't it? <laughs> That's what I thought. <laughs> but anyway, look, we, we sat around posing hard questions in terms of um, what kind of complexity do we need right now in our models in terms of the ocean in the near term, what kind of resolution. Uh, we know we'll eventually go to a wave coupling, but what are our priorities right now? And we, we were talking about in terms of do we really want to add a lot of complexity where the model uncertainty is the greatest? And so we, we were asking hard questions like this. One of the things we talked about, um, and we're going to have a report coming um, uh, out on all of the, these discussions, um, because we wanted to address near term. Is there stuff on the shelf right now that we can put into our models to help? Uh, improve some of these forecasts. We know that, look, if you have inappropriate physics and, and physics that just isn't working, it doesn't make a whole lot of sense to do a whole lot of tuning, you know, to those physics. So um, what are we going to do in the short term and uh, then, of course, the longer term? But one of the things that we uh, immediately agreed on was that we need to continue to amass and focus a concentrated effort in mild di diagnostics. And of course, um, you know, I, I thought about um, developing this effort here at the DTC. I think the DTC is perfectly positioned to do this. Um, we will uh, have a focus group uh, looking at vortex scale and the uh, hurricane environment. Um, we have thousands of forecasts over the years, a whole lot of data that nobody has really exploited all that much. And not only comparing our model forecast to observations, but making intermodel comparisons. And I was thinking about during the Figgy era, when we were developing the global models and mesoscale models, in which we did a lot of intermodel comparisons. I think we can learn a lot from one another. I think there's a lot to share. I'm very interested in the results that Chris Davis got, and I'm hoping that 
Chris Snyder will pick up and uh, we, we can run the HWARF off of the ENKF and, and do all sorts of experiments, and also with co-amps as well. Uh, in terms of model challenges, Richard talked a lot about this, but in terms of a, a track like Dennis, if your forecast goes a little bit more over land, you can end up with a different forecast than keeping it offshore. Ike, we had a lot of spreads. Wilma, Erica, rapid intensification, rapid weakening, sheared environments. Umberto came out of nowhere. Um, but it's a new era for community collaboration. We have an infrastructure in place now that I'm, I'm absolutely a believer, very supportive of, uh, to support the community codes, and that's the Developmental Test Center. It's a tremendous asset that can support uh, research operations and operations back to research. Uh, we need the involvement of the community, and hence the tutorial after this. I hope many students here will pick up on a lot of the problems we're talking about and challenges uh, to help us improve our hurricane forecasts. And uh, we're making available the NCAR research model, the NCEP operational model for your choice. And we've got a lot of work to do. These top three are critical, top two are critical in terms of the initialization. What observations for the data simulation we've got in situ, but we also need to better exploit the satellite observations for the hurricane core, all the, uh, the physics suite for higher resolution, what resolution to best uh, address intensity forecast. I believe we need to get down below five kilometers. The whole ensemble problem in terms of multi-model ensembles for intensity coupled to the ocean and the ocean data simulation. Hendrik, I'm sure, will talk about the uh, importance of forecasting waves up to the beach and um, all the physics that goes with that and the wave interactions with the currents, eventually coupling to a land surface model. All of this is dependent on affordable complexity of what we really need in terms of sea spray microphysics, what we can uh, computationally afford, what makes the best sense, what combination will give the best forecast. This is eventually uh, the kind of coupled system we are looking at to a wave model, to an ocean model, to high estuary and coastal bay models um, uh, to eventually address storm inundation. So this is where we're heading in the longer term, but uh, we've got a lot of challenges ahead of us in the meantime. <laughs>